Two academic books, Longfellow's Imaginative Engagement, The Works of His Late Career, uh, March 2022, and Divergent Visions, Contested Spaces, The Early United States Through the Lens of Travel. In 2015, he was awarded the Diana Korsnick Research Fellowship from the Friends of Longfellow House. Uh, shout out to the Friends of Longfellow House, thank you so much. Uh, this spring of 2022, he received a grant from the Pennsylvania State System of Higher Education to pursue archival research on the late career works of the Fireside Poets, uh, including uh, William Cullen Bryant, Henry Wadsworth Longfellow, John Greenleaf Whittier, Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr., and James Russell Cole. Jeff credits his interest in archival research uh, to the encouragement and uh, guidance of Christine Chrisworth. Thank you so much for being here today. Uh, retired archivist at the Longfellow House, uh, the generosity of Diana Korsnick and the friends of the Longfellow House, and the work of the current and previous staff of Longfellow House, including current archivist uh, Kate Hansen class. So I will now turn it over to you. start with a photograph. This was taken in 1880, two years before Longfellow's death, and this is from the Longfellow House collection. And this is on the cover of my book, this picture. And I emailed Kate Hansen class to just find out if I could use the picture for the book, and I asked the year that the picture was taken, and within about 45 minutes or an hour, Kate sends me this response. Um, and this is very in keeping with the Longfellow House. I won't read it, but essentially there are two different descript two different dates of uh, origin. And so Kate tells me that on the photo itself, there's an inscription that gives one date, 1881, from Thomas de Valcourt. He was uh, one of the first archivists in the house. And then there's another record, and she says they're conflicting, and then she makes the judgment, which is absolutely correct, in my opinion. And this is sort of what it's like here for even a small question, this level of detail and precision. So I'm going to start with just a slide with some key biographical facts. Uh, some of us may know them already. And then I'll sort of progress through to, I think, uh, information that may not be known. And I'll talk about my book. So. It's important to have this biographical information just in mind for tonight's talk. So um, in his final two decades from 1861 to 1882, Longfellow had suffered a tragic loss. His wife, Fanny Elizabeth Appleton, uh, died in the home, her dress caught on fire. Uh, and this took place, the accident took place on July 9th, and she died on July 10th in the home library. She was 43 years old, and they'd been married for 18 years, nearly 18 years. Uh, with the loss of his beloved wife, he became a single father of five children, uh, aging range from 17 to five, and the children are behind me on the wall. Um, he had suffered the loss of his first wife, Mary Storer Potter, uh, in, on November 29, 1835. Uh, due to complications to a miscarriage while they were traveling in Europe. And she was 23 years old at the time, and they had been married for two years. Uh, later on this same trip, he's abroad to uh, hone his language skills so he can become the um, modern language professor at Harvard University. He then meets Fanny, his second wife, and they have a stormy courtship for six years. Uh, he loses his third child, his daughter Fanny. She's about 18 months old. She's also on here. 
uh, and she's named after Fanny, his second wife. Um, and the other detail here is that Charlie, his son, in 1863 joins the, um, the cavalry um, and against Longfellow's wishes. And Charlie nearly dies. He has two near-death experiences. Um, and he leads a peripatetic, that's a nice $20 word, uh, <laughs> traveling, wandering life. So after Fanny dies, uh, I just have here uh, four quick accounts of how Longfellow reacts. Um, so she dies on July 10th, um, 1861. Cornelius Felton is his friend and also a, the president of Harvard University. He writes to Charles Sumner, who's also Longfellow's close friend, and is in Washington as the senator. Um, and he says, quote, but he dreads his recovery from the physical pain of his wounds. Then he says, then I shall have to take up the great burden. I do not know how I shall bear it. So he's quoting Longfellow. Uh, and then Felton says, you know, pain has been a blessing to him because it distracts him. And then he says that the consolations for Longfellow's life will come in good time, and they'll come from his children and friends and from literature. And that is absolutely true. So Felton knows he sort of predicts Longfellow's future. Uh, Samuel Longfellow, that's Longfellow's youngest brother. He learns the news of Fanny's death while he's in Italy. He picks up a newspaper and learns about it in the paper. And that gives you a sense of how the uh, esteem and the, um, the fame of the Longfellow. So this would be reported in uh, papers internationally. He writes to his brother. Uh, Samuel was a reverend, a Unitarian minister. He writes, uh, you will know how much I feel with you this heavy grief, which in so painful a way has come upon your heart and your home. Yet I cannot but hope that light is in the cloud also. Then he quotes the Quaker uh, George Fox. Quote, I looked, said George Fox, and beheld an ocean of darkness, but I also saw that around it flowed an infinite ocean of light. This is also in the Longfellow House in the archive here. I think that's true. Longfellow writes a letter to his sister-in-law, Fanny's sister, uh, on August 18th, 1861. This is the first extant letter that we have of him writing after this tragedy. And he writes, how I am alive after what I have seen, I know not. And then he says that he knows that they led a beautiful life and he's grateful for the life that they led. The last speaker about this event is Ernest Longfellow. That is Longfellow's second son. He's 15 years old when this happens, and he's interacting with his father, and he recounts this in a book called Random Memories, which was published in 1922, right after Ernest died in its Ernest's memoirs. And this is what he writes, quote, my father was badly burned while trying to save her, and I remember his lying in bed and holding up his poor bandaged hands and murmuring, oh, why could I not save her? And he does attempt to save his wife, um, but he fails. So let's keep those four items in mind. So I'll just tell you a little bit about my book. Um, so my book starts with this event and goes all the way to Longfellow's death and then covers the posthumous publications, the publications after his, his own death. And it's a book that looks at the literature that he produces and his biography, and it's a literary biography. Um, so it's looking at those two components. And for the last two decades of his career, he writes 10 original works of poetry. He produces the first complete translation by an American in English of Dante's Divine Comedy. He completes a revised translation of European poetry, which is about 750 pages, which would have been an amazing achievement at the time, this type of anthology. It's the second edition of it. And he then completes a 31 volume global literature anthology, which is mind blowing in terms of this conception. So that's what he produces while he's alive in those 20 years. Uh, there are also two posthumous publications that come out, two posthumous books right after he dies. So that gives us 12 original volumes of poetry, 10 published while he's alive, two more after he's died, and then three other major projects. So 15 major projects in these 20 years. Um, he receives honorary doctorates from Oxford and Cambridge, he has a statuary um, built for him, 
Um, he is enshrined at uh, Poets' Corner in Westminster Abbey. And the New York Times writes on March 25th, 1882, covering his death, he dies on March 24th. Uh, and this is correct. It would be hard to name a person not present in the United States whose death would carry regret to so wide and various a multitude of men, women, and mere children as that of Mr. Longbow does today. During these 20 years, he's at the height of his fame, and he's leading a kind of complicated life dealing with this tragedy. Uh, he's a public figure dealing with a lot of private trauma. These are the 15 books in 21 years. Okay, so why this project? So just four quick reasons. So there are people that have covered his entire career, but no one's focused on the late career as a distinct period. That's one. Uh, second, this late career period you can make a pretty good argument that he writes more poetry in the late career than he does in the 40 years before, from 1820 to 1861. He certainly publishes more in those final 20 years than he did in the first 40 years of poems. So that's second. Third, the recent biographies, which are all excellent, they cover the late career with much less detail. And fourth, I think there's a lot of misunderstanding or lingering misunderstanding about the late career as being a disappointment. And primarily that comes, I believe, from the fact that he's considered a popular poet, and his most popular books are published before 1861. So if you're looking at him as a popular poet, you might think, well, the works later were not as popular, so therefore maybe that, that part of the career is less uh, important. So here are my findings. So first, in his late career, we have a questioning and a sense of vulnerability that is very relevant to uh, readers at the time and readers and people today. He's grappling with profound and sudden bereavement, the traumatic death of his second wife. He is exploring subjects in a perturbed, restless, often anxious manner. Um, his poetry in the late career looks at human frailty and thinks of human limitation, that there are limitations in what human beings can do artistically, spiritually, and socially. His late career has a philosophical interest, it has a deep religious interest, and his views on religion are that Christianity is an incomplete project. Uh, it is not a complete uh, path yet. Um, He's extremely knowledgeable about the world and about literary traditions, and he will utilize those, and he will then get to the limits of what those traditions can answer, because he has a wealth of knowledge at his disposal. And the last question is, he's wondering what poetry can do to assuage the sufferings of the human experience. And those sufferings are loss, they are aging, they are mortality. And his poetry is going to look at all of those questions, and those are fundamental realities of our human existence. Two, his late career is challenging to read because he publishes his works in an interconnected pattern where he will publish pieces in different volumes in series that go over a long period of time. So, for instance, he has a series called Tales of a Wayside Inn. It comes in three installments in 1863, 1872, and 1873. That's where Paul Revere's Ride finds its home. It's in three different books. And so the question for you as a researcher is, do I look at it as a whole in itself, or do I look at it as it interacts with the books that it's in? And you can't really do both. You can only look at it one way or the other. You cannot conceptually look at it both ways. And he has many different series like that. There's a Birds of a Passage series, so you can look at that as a complete series, or you can look at how that interacts in the various books. So it's actually kind of hard to figure out what he's doing, and the collected anthologies of his poetry don't reflect how they appear in the volume. The last part is he's revising and revisiting themes over and over again. I make a note here, it, it's almost like a Moby Dick idea of his career, where you kind of see it, but you can't see it. 
you can't actually hold it all in your mind because it's so interconnected. His late career has six phases, uh, in my opinion. Um, so part one, and these, my book is divided into six parts. So part one deals with, you know, what stories can do to solve the problems of the world, particularly uh, the Civil War and Reconstruction. Like how can the stories of a poet address the complexities of the world? Part two looks at this quest for perfection in his writing. So he'll write um, a volume called Fleur de Luce, which is all about like, can we gain perfection through poetry? And he writes The Divine Comedy, which is considered to be a work of genius and a work of perfection, literary perfection. He does his translation. He ends this period with a book called The New England Tragedies, which is basically about the tragedies of the Salem witch trials and about the Quaker persecution in New England. So he starts with this idea of perfection and he ends with tragedy. And of course, the Puritans, they are seeking perfection, but they fail. They fail in the earthly world. Part three is his vision of Christianity, which I mentioned as an incomplete project. Part four, he switches. After he's discussed all these serious themes, he goes to aestheticism. And in the 1870s, there's a large movement in aestheticism, or the idea that art is itself like an ennobling uh, end to itself. It's an end in and of itself. And so he sort of engages with that field of aestheticism. And then his last books look at travel, actual physical travel in the world as a metaphor for the travel of the end of our life into our mortality. Uh, the epilogue of my book looks at the cross of the snow and his posthumous publications. These are the research materials. So um, I'm using this 11 volume edition, which is terrific, from 1904. I'm using this collection of his letters, which is uh, put together brilliantly by this scholar named Andrew Hyland. This is a work that I have not found a single error in. It's just uh, almost perfection. Uh, I'm looking at transcriptions of his journals and the actual journals from Houghton Library and Kate Hansen Plass from the Longfellow House uh, compiled the transcriptions. I'm looking at materials from Houghton Library, which is just down the street at Harvard, which has a major repository of his papers, an unbelievable repository. And if you take the repository here and the repository at Harvard, you have what I think is a unique vision of a poet's life and of his family. Almost unprecedented, I think, uh, just within walking distance. I'm using the materials from the Longfellow House, and then I'm looking at publication history, book production, his book contracts, uh, and his legacy after he dies, and then I'm using all the existing scholarship, what people have done. So I'm sort of trying to weave all this together. I also use a lot of unpublished material that I found at Houghton Library, and I'm going to talk about that, and that this will be a major part of what we'll discuss in just a few minutes. Um, so I found just a treasure trove of unpublished materials at Houghton Library. Um, and so these are usually on scraps of paper, and they are very, very revealing about Longfellow's private life. Um, they express feelings and thoughts in an unguarded way. So Longfellow is a prolific letter writer, and he's an excellent letter writer. And when I email, I actually email in a Longfellow style, like very polite and formal and proper. Uh, his journal is very guarded. He keeps a journal throughout most of his life, but he doesn't reveal his private thoughts. And so these little fragments are our best vision of his private life, uh, in addition to his published poems. Um, and my last comment about the unpublished poems is that we should look at them as complementing the published material. The published material is the definitive record. This is just helping us to understand what's already there, uh, in my opinion. So he has many strong female characters in his late career. Uh, and his late career in these last 20 years, almost every volume has some female character and often a male character that's longing for a female character. Um, and the male characters in these late career poems are often very confused. Um, so we have this quest for a, uh, a female presence that's going to bring order to the world. And these female characters are typically heroines, and they're typically counteracting the destructive drives of male characters. And in his late career poetry, Fanny Longfellow is a character, 
uh, and she's then merged with other women, uh, two women in particular, Victoria Colonia and Beatrice from the Divine Comedy. Okay, so that's the overview. Now we're going to look at some specifics. So this is just a quick primer on what a sonnet is, 14-line poem. There are two varieties, um, Shakespearean and Petrarchan. Longfellow's writing in the Italian style. It's an eight-line unit and a six-line unit. That's the main concept. So I'm going to look at The Cross of Snow. That's uh, one of his most famous poems. It's published posthumously. It's included, so it's found among his papers. The family decides to publish it. Longfellow himself did not publish it, but the family decided to. And they put it into the official family biography of Longfellow. So his brother, Samuel, writes the official biography. He puts two sonnets in there, uh, Mezzo Kamen and Cross of Snow. Mezzo Kamen is a sonnet before Longfellow marries Fanny, and he's longing and he's confused about his life in 1842. And the Cross of Snow is a sonnet that he writes on July 10th, 1879, which is on the 18th anniversary of his beloved wife's death. And this is put into the collection as a way of kind of explaining his biography these two poems. He, they could have been put in at a different volume, but the family decided very wisely to put them in this collection, so they get high, they get sort of spotlighted. The Cross of Snow is generally considered to be the only poem where he talks directly about Fanny. Um, there's another poem that does it, but this is generally considered like the best vision of Fanny. So I mentioned this, how they're positioned in this biography. Um, I mentioned this, that they are described life without Fanny. One is he wants to marry her, and the second one is she's uh, deceased. Uh, I mentioned that it's very wise to put them in this placement, and the Cross of Snow is uh, considered to be, uh, it's critically acclaimed. Um, and Samuel also provides a little gloss on how to interpret the poem. Uh, and that's, little gloss is the way that has informed the interpretation of the poem since. So the poem itself, um, this is how Samuel describes it. At night, as he looked upon the pictured countenance that hung upon his chamber wall, this is a picture of Fanny in his bedroom, his thoughts framed themselves in the verses that follow. He put them away in his portfolio where they were found after his death. And Samuel also mentioned that he had seen this image in a Western scenery book of a cross of snow on a mountain in Colorado. This is the poem. It's on a little flimsy piece of paper uh, at Houghton Library. This is the octave, the eight-line unit. This is the six-line unit. There's the date, July 10th, 1879, 18 years after Fanny's death. Here's the poem. In the long sleepless watches of the night, a gentle face, the face of one long dead, looks at me from the wall where around its head the night lamp casts a hallow of pale light. Here in this room she died, and soul more white, never through martyrdom of fire was led to its repose, martyrdom of fire, reference to the circumstances of her death. Nor can in books be read the legend of a life more benedite or blessed. There's a, so this is the, the portrait, and the second part is now this image of the mountain, of this crevice of snow. I'm going to show you a picture of it. There's a mountain in the distant west that some defined steep ravines, displays a cross of snow upon its side, such as the cross I wear upon my breast these 18 years. That's the reference of, to Fanny's death and the date, um, July 10th, 18, uh, 61, 1879, uh, through all the changing seasons, and seasons changeless since the day she died. So he's wearing this cross on his breast. This is the portrait, the first part. This is in the bedroom, you can see it. All the tours go there, everyone sees this. That's where the light is on Fanny's portrait. This is the bedroom. The portrait is right there. This is the Cross of Snow. This is an image of this uh, mountaintop in Colorado. There were stories about this crevasse where there was a cross of snow, and then someone took a picture of it and said, yes, it's there. And then Thomas Moran um, painted it as well, and this circulated in the United States, and Longfellow saw it, and he then used this to guide the second stanza. And Nicholas Basbanes has a great discussion of this in his biography, a great discussion. Okay, so now I'm going to connect this. So all of that is sort of established knowledge. On the poem. So I'm going to connect this to some of the unpublished materials and some other materials to look at the poem in, a, in another way. Um, so the first thing I want to show you, I'll just make the caveat again that the published works is the final sort of record and we look at this to supplement. And I have permission from this and this is now material that hasn't been discussed in previous scholarship. Okay, so here's one unpublished 
Longfellow 10 line poem fragment about his deceased wife, Fanny. It's dated February 21st, 1863, 16 years before the cross of snow. This is the first part. This is the second part. I'm tired, so I'm gonna read the transcription, <laughs> which is here. Um, a evening lamps that looked upon her face, and it's just interesting to look at how it's constructed. You can see little areas where he has cross outs mm -hmm. and underlined, let's see, like this part. That's always interesting to look at. It's not pristine like the cross of snow. This is something else. Here it is. O evening lamps that looked upon her face night after night, ye shine but see it not, and shall behold it never more, never more, exclamation mark. O home that art no longer home to me, O motherless children, fatherless almost, O evening lamps that shone upon her face, O clock that counted as swift the happy hours, off interrupting with thy garrulous tongue, the lovely voice that I shall hear no more. So let's compare this to the cross of snow. We have O evening lamps, he's struggling to reconcile himself in a life without the beloved, and the lamps are shining on an absence. There's nothing there. He talks about the clock. This line is just um, heartbreaking. Oh, motherless children, fatherless almost. A level of bereavement and being so bereft that he feels like he's not able to perform the duties of a father. And I'll just say he performs the duties of a father perfectly, it, it, from my point of view. In 1862, he takes the children, this is the a uh, year after Fanny Smith, he takes his, he goes on a, a tour of the Niagara Falls region with his two sons and the extended family. He continues the summer vacations at Nahant in 1862. Um, in 1863, he's sort of trying to retain a sense of normalcy. So he's not, from my point of view, a distant figure. He's very active in the lives of the children. You have the evening lamps in the cross of snow or the night lamp, I should say, that replaces the evening lamp. But in the cross of snow, it's now shining on the portrait and creating the nimbus of a saintly figure. And in the cross of snow, since the light is on Fanny's face on the portrait, she's alive, or, or, or seems seemingly alive, and not absent. So for me, I see Longfellow in 1863 starting with an image that he resolves by 1879, that he's moved to a different place with this image, but it's somehow some, it's somewhere inside him. Here's another one. This one's called Portraits. And I didn't include the, um, the fragment here, the original, but this is it. This is the transcription. After a day of troubled evening came, the sun emerging from a cloudy pall, lighted the western room and touched with flame the portraits on the wall. Oops. So portraits is also dealing with light and images. It's not dated. Uh, but in this one, the it's actually on an image like the night lamp, the, the night lamp in the cross of snow. Uh, and it potentially brings consolation. And it's also a poem that is situated in a space. So I think that this poem is in the western room of the Longfellow, in the house, and it's the dining room. And the uh, tour guides can see if that's true. If, it's, if the sunset is there and they illuminate the portraits in the room, um, and there are portraits of Fanny, there's a triple portrait of the three Longfellow daughters, and there's a profile portrait of Mary Appleton, Macintosh, Fanny's sister. And so these portraits are coming alive, but it's touched with flame, which is the fire imagery again. And this is fire imagery that we will see. We see it in the cross of snow. We also see it in a sonnet called Sonnet 4, which I've not included, um, uh, which talks about the garments of flame. Touched with flame is also like a Promethean image. Here's one about pain. So you've got the image, like how is he working through this image of light and portrait and not seeing the beloved's face and longing to see the beloved's face. 
this is a, a fragment just about pain. So you have imagery, and then you have pain, which is what the cross of snow deals with as well. So this fragment, this is what it looks like, I'll read this. So long ago, so very long ago, and yet the thought comes back to me again with a great shock and agony of pain. No context, no date, but for me as a reader, I think, well, the tragic event is Fanny's death, coming back. Here's another one, I'm longing for the beloved as a feeling, not an image. With what a vain and infinite appeal, the heart cries out for what it once possessed. The past is gone from us and is at rest, but we are restless and still keenly feel. Here's one. This is from a different collection. So the other ones are in um, item 144. I hope those are just unpublished materials, poems. This is in a collection associated with this work that he writes, Michelangelo, uh, which is a verse drama about Michelangelo, the artist, that's published after his death. So it's in a different collection, so it's probably intended for that collection. But here it is. The cold and sunless days that deaden thought as one who suddenly sees the dead mother in the children's faces and weeps afresh. This is seeing the image now of the beloved and the children, and that's the causing pain. This is portraits. I got it mixed up somewhere. This is one about uh, lost joy. Uh, the hours of secret joy that came and vanished, leaving behind no vestige of their fleet and flying feet. This is the last one I'm going to show you, then we're going to shift to a different topic. Um, so this is a fragment that deals with old age, but it views old age as not a time of wisdom and knowledge, but old age as a time of confusion. So I'm going to read it to you. You cannot see till you have climbed the hill how vast the horizon opens on all sides, how inaccessible the mountain peaks that seem so near us from the vale below. This is true. If you approach a mountain from a distance, you don't know how far it is. You don't know. It may seem close, but it's really far. In youth, we think to reach them at a bound. In age, we find them farther than before. So not actually reaching that space. This is a published poem, um, and this is um, this is called Victor and Vanquished. This was not Longfellow did not publish this during his lifetime, but the family published it in this collection called In the Harbor. This is a sonnet that's looking at old age and death, but has a very different view of old age and death. So I, I want to contrast the two. So the one that we have here is you get you, you age and everything gets farther away. This is a different idea. It's a beautiful sonnet in my opinion. Victor and Vanquish, one of my favorite. As one who long hath fled with panting breath before his foe, bleeding and near to fall, I turn and set my back against the wall. You can imagine, your back against the wall. And look ye in the face triumphant death. I call for aid, and no one answereth. I'm alone with thee who conquereth all. Yet me thy threatening form doth not appall, for thou art but a phantom and a wraith. Wounded and weak, sword broken at the hilt, with armor shattered and without a shield, I stand unmoved. Do with me what thou wilt. I can resist no more, but will not yield. This is no tournament where cowards tilt. The vanquished here is victor of the field. This is acceptance of death accepting the end of life, still going to fight it, but accepting that it's going to happen, and you are the victor when you accept it. It's about a certain victory. It's very similar to John Donne's Death Be Not Proud, um, but it's about accepting death, and it reminds me of The Death of Ivan Illich by Leo Tolstoy. This is a character, it's a great short story, a great novella. In The Death of um, Ivan Illich, you have a character who's sick and dying, and he just cannot deal with that, and his family rejects him, 
And at the very, very end, he accepts it and he just transcends, like in the very end of the story. And so I see it similar here. And um, Ilya, the death of Ivan Ilyich was published in 1886. This is published in 1882. So this Longfellow is thinking of this. He's not influenced by it. Okay, now I'm going to give you another source for the cross of snow. We've talked about two that are established. This one that I discovered this in May. Um, so Longfellow, in his first published book in 1835, his first significant published book, called Outer Mirror, A Pilgrimage Behind the Sea, uh, Longfellow writes like a travelogue about his first trip to Europe. So he goes to Europe uh, from 1826 to 1829 as a young man. That's how he's getting his training to be a modern language professor at Bowdoin College. Goes there for three years. He spends a lot of time in Spain and a lot of time in Italy. And he travels around. And then in 1835, he keeps notes. He writes this book. Uh, and it's an eclectic travel book. It has humor. It has stories. It gives you the culture. Uh, and in one of them, a section on Spain, um, he talks about someone who has a cross on his breast. Um, and it's the section called The Devotional Poetry of Spain. The character is Eusebio. He um, is an orphan. He's born allegedly by a mountain where there's a cross in front of it. And now he has a cross of snow and he survives lots of uh, terrible events, including an escaping a burning house on Corpus Christi Day. And he then says, I have a cross on my breast that's protecting me. He falls in love with a woman named Julia. Julia also has a cross on her breast. Um, and Julia um, is very wealthy, and Eusebio is an orphan, and uh, Julia's family says, no, you can't marry Eusebio. Uh, she uh, goes to a convent, he uh, breaks into the convent, he kisses her, um, and he um, gets into a battle with her brother. At the end, we learn that Eusebio is actually related to Julia and is Julia's sister. Um, so, uh, Eusebio is a sinner. He's not a holy person with the cross of snow. He has it. He's a sinner. He's redeemed at the end. So, I don't know if Longfellow was aware that he's kind of talked about this already, but it's in his text. It's there. Okay, now I'm going to talk about Longfellow's sonnets. So, he's credited with 63 sonnets. <coughs> 61 are published during his lifetime, and then two are published posthumously in that collection that Samuel Longfellow, his brother, puts together about his biography. Those two are Mezzo Kamen, which I have on this page, and then The Cross of Stone, which we just talked about. So 63. Um, there's a really good book, uh, an Introduction 1907, that talks about the sonnets um, by uh, Ferris Greenslet. And Greenslet says, you know, it's really interesting that Longfellow, he masters the sonnet form at the end of his career. Uh, Nicholas Basbane makes the same point. Nicholas Basbane's uh, Longfellow's re recent biographer, he says, you know, he's the finest writer of American sonnets, American writer of sonnets. So Longfellow wrote um, two sonnets about Fanny. One is called The Evening Star in 1845, while she was alive, and one is The Cross of Snow, which we discussed. Um, he writes two published poems that reference his first wife, Mary Storer Potter, Footsteps of Angels, which is well known, and The Haunted Chamber, I could talk a lot about, but I won't. Um, but this is actually a poem that was published in 1872. If you read it, you think that it's actually about Fanny. You think that it's about Fanny, and you think that it's about uh, their daughter, who's passed away. But in fact, this poem was written in 1845. And it's written at a time, and it's a crazy poem, where he's, he sees a ghost, and it's a woman, and she's pointing to a cemetery, and it's actually about his first wife. And at this time, he has two children. Uh, this child is uh, either born or about to be born in earnest. And I see it as like an anxiety poem. You know, he's, he's had two children. His wife is either pregnant or just about to have, just had earnest, and he's worried. So it's interesting. Um, so in addition to all of this, there's another sonnet, which I'm going to show you. Sonnet 64. Uh, this is hitherto unpublished, and Longfellow did not want to publish this, and his family didn't want to publish it. I know that because it was not published. <laughs> okay, here it is. This is the first set. You've got the octave. You've got the set step. You've got the date. 
January 15, 1873. So let's see what this poem is about. I'll read the transcription. How many women are there whose fair shapes have flashed across our lives, seen once alone and never more forgotten, like a tone of music that from memory ne'er escapes, or like the landscape that a vapor drapes, and for a little moment only shown, we take unto our hearts and call our own, with glimpses of seas and far-off misty capes. Alas, alas, that those who interweave these golden threads into the woof of light should vanish from us and be seen no more, that we should feel vacancy they leave and hear of them as mothers and as wife and dream about them as they were before. Okay, so let's analyze this. So we have first person pronouns. We have we and our, plural, not I. It's a poem about a romantic love for unnamed women from the past who have now married and become wives and mothers. And he talks about how they flash across our lives and we still long for them. He makes it into a, a generalized universal experience. We take into our hearts and call our own for a little moment only shown. If we view the poem or the sonnet autobiographically, these women cannot be Longfellow's two wives. Because he married them. So it's about other women. It's about other women. So this suggests attachments before or after these relationships. And the one thing to know about his relationship with Fanny is it's, it's often considered to be sort of the ideal marriage, the best possible marriage. And so now in 1873, he's describing other women, and they're not Mary, story, Sir Potter, his first wife, and they're, it's not Fanny. In addition to all of this, you have a lot of the same imagery that we've seen. The vacant um, image, the vacant lover, or the image of the memory of the memory of the lover or the beloved that you can't recapture. So it's similar to O Evening Lamps, that um, the O Evening Lamps frag fragment. It's also similar to the Cross of Snow, and just to note, it's in ready to print form. This is like what you could call like a holograph. This could go to the printer. Polish. <clears throat> okay, so I'm just gonna talk about late career romantic imagination in Longfellow's life. So with the exception of one book uh, that talks about Catherine Sherwood Bonner, McDowell, there's very little research on Longfellow's friendships with women after Fanny's death. And the most recent scholars, um, Charles C. Calhoun, Edward uh, Cefeli, and Nicholas Basbane, they don't talk about this at all. Um, uh, Calhoun is a really great biography. All the biographers are great. His, he, this passage was this with one sentence. He had an especially appreciative eye for handsome younger women. There are vague hints in the late 1860s and 1870s of mild flirtations, perhaps one serious flutter of the heart. So the biographical evidence requires care, but as I said before, the late career poetry shows someone longing for, for women, uh, idealized women, for women to be heroines. And we see it in these different publications. But Longfellow knew three women uh, who were much younger than him uh, that he had a powerful sort of moment with. Uh, one is Cornelia Fish, she was 26 years old. The second is Alice Mary Freire, she was 25 years old. This was in the 1860s. And what we see in these relationships, which we have scant information about, is a susceptibility to spontaneous attractions. He's not seeking to remarry, um, but I think he's meeting these people and he's feeling attached. With these two women, we have extant outgoing correspondence. We have his letters to them. And what we find is a pattern. And I'm going to explain what the pattern is. And you see it in the letters. And Cornelia Fitch is a longer period of time. That goes on for a while. Um, with Alice Mary Freire, it's like a few weeks. 
but you have initial attraction. It's recorded in his journal. We have some meetings and letters. We have Longfellow receiving a letter from each one, a, a, a photograph from each woman. And then we have the woman saying that she was previously engaged in both instances. And in both the correspondence, he'll quote Philippians 4 8 when he accepts that they are attached to someone else. So Andrew Hyland, the scholar I said that wrote the six, did the six volume letters, this is a no-nonsense scholar who gets it right every time. He sees the relationships as important enough that he includes their portraits in the, in the volumes. You can see them. Uh, Edward Wagenknecht, he's a scholar, a biographer from the 1950s. By the way, he died at the age of 101 and was writing books into his 80s. Um, he died in, uh, I think it's like 2001. He was born in like 1899. Um, he says about Freire, quote, it's possible that he may have asked her to marry him. And there's a little bit of evidence for that in like a spontaneous connection. And he says it's possible, and that's italicized. That, those are his italics, not mine. Okay, so we have two. Sherwood Bonner is someone that he meets after the sonnet. So he writes the sonnet January 5th, 1873. Sherwood Bonner is someone that comes into his life in 1873. Um, he has these patronage style relationships, and a lot of these uh, 19th century male writers have these relationships with women, but they kind of like nurture them or mentor them. Uh, John Greenleaf Whittier had a nurturing relationship with a poet named Lucy Larkin. Um, so, Catherine Sherwood Bonner McDowell, Sherwood Bonner, um, is a married woman with a child, comes to Boston, uh, writes to Longfellow, asks to meet him, uh, and seeks his help uh, in furthering her publishing career. She's 24 when they meet. He becomes her amanuensis secretary and helps with that giant Poems of Places 31 volume collection. They spend a lot of time together working on the collection. Uh, and it's an intermittent working, intermittent working relationship. And I see this as a very complicated relationship. Uh, and it's the subject of rumor in the 1800s. People are talking about this. Um, so Bonner was married. She eventually gets a divorce on May 5th, 1881. Um, so divorce in the 19th century is unheard of. And a single woman traveling to Boston who's a married woman traveling to Boston is uh, very unusual. She later travels up with her daughter, and that's like a cause of scandal as well. <coughs> Longfellow supports her. He wires $500, we know. Uh, there are in indications that he's giving her money along the way. There's one letter where she asks for a $600 loan. That's about $18,000 in our current hmm. money. Um, she's an extremely talented writer, and she dies young in 1883 from breast cancer. We have um, her letters, 54 of them, at Houghton Library. Mm -hmm. I've read them. And we have one letter that Longfellow wrote to her of 59 that are in his ledger book. So there's a long correspondence, and then they're meeting in Boston, in Cambridge. She's at the house. Um, she dedicates her novel, which he helps her publish, uh, to him, and there's a poem in dedication. And there's a rhyme of heart and art uh, in that dedication. But I want to show you this. So this is a French poem that Longfellow allegedly wrote, sent to Sherwood Bonner, and Sherwood Bonner then put it in one of her stories. Um, and Sophia Kirk, who's Sherwood Bonner's literary executor, she attributes the poem to Longfellow. It's in French. He does write a few, some poems in foreign languages, but not many. This is what uh, Sophia Kirk says. She describes it as a dainty French poem from Longfellow's hand. It was published there with his consent, but had his request without acknowledgement, the making of verses in foreign tongue being regarded as a mere pastime <coughs> of the poet who was the master of his own. So she attributes it to him. It's not indexed anywhere. This is a translation from Google Translate. Um, <laughs> so my French instruction ended in seventh grade at Holdrum. Uh, middle school, um, but this is a very um, sensual poem. 
Um, and it's about a speaker who's obsessed with a woman and is obsessed with her high heel boots, her, her mom, uh, and he's singing her praises and he's in love with her. And in Longfellow's published works, there's only one poem that has this type of like sensual, sensual love, not, not spiritual, not, it's just physical, is a translation in Aftermath. And this short story was published in 1878. That's a year before the Cross of Snow. I could go into the details. So it's in a short story. The short story is interesting because there is a character who kind of tells a story that's like Evangeline to trick a young woman to give her her diamond earrings. Um, and so it's almost, it's a local color story. So at this time, in the 19th century, there's a new movement of regional writing and realism and local color writing. That's Bonner's area. Longfellow's like a different era. And so it's this story is almost in some ways like a deconstruction of one of Longfellow's major works. There's that in there. You'd have to read it to, to assess that. Okay, so we're almost done. So the cross of snow is about faithfulness and love as a cross. It's a complicated image. I think we can read it that way. So here's what we have. We have documentary evidence of Longfellow's experience in 1861. You know how he's feeling because you have quotes from people that knew him in his own letters. He feels that he wishes to save him, uh, her, he can't bear it, etc. Two, we have the publication of the cross of snow. Longfellow does not publish it, but the Longfellow family does. It's critically acclaimed. Three, the cross of snow references photography, painting, a family portrait, the items in the poet's bedroom, and a cross at the heart, which Longfellow talked about in 1835 on the breast of a sinner. We have evidence of Longfellow working through light imagery, fire imagery, the emotions of Fanny's death, and several unpublished poem fragments, and his family, and he chose not to publish the material. We have the sonnet. So Longfellow writes 60 sonnets after 1864, and then the new sonnet, which would make it 61. And it's about longing for women uh, who become other men's wives and wanting to go back to how someone knew them in the past. They're not Fanny, and they're not Mary. We have Longfellow's decision and the family's decision not to publish that sonnet. We have the connection with Cornelia Fish. We have the connection with Alice Mary Freire. We have the Sherwood Bonner friendship. We have the love poem in Bonner's short story. We have quest narratives throughout his late career for an idealized women, woman. And then we have a bunch of published poems that are dealing with these themes as well, which I have not covered today. So all this material, everything here, exists before Longfellow writes The Cross of Snow. All this is before, not after. Everything that I've shown. So for me, this epitomized the late career complexities. This is what you find in the late career. This is just one example of it. Um, so just to close, um, Longfellow's life is a fully lived life and a richly imagined life and it's a life that he's revealing and concealing he's engaging with traditions of literature of religion um, he is extremely knowledgeable about the world a massive library that he can draw from. he um, reads in numerous languages uh, he speaks numerous languages he draws from all of that. We have a record of a restless, introspective self that's seeking equilibrium in published poems and that's dealing with con uh, contradictory impulses. We have him performing a public role as the nation's poet, and we have him using his poetry almost as a protective shield at the same time. And his poems, as we talked about, deal with aging, suffering, and death, which come to all regardless of social stature. 
He's a symbolic figure to the public. When he dies, there's an outpouring of mourning. The lay career, I think, highlights all these complexities and difficulties and their vulnerabilities that we all know. The verdict on the cross of snow is, to me, there's nothing surprising about the complexity at all. This is what people's lives are like. We have these contradictions inside. This is a quote from Victor E. Frankel in Man's Search for Meaning. <clears throat> this is about how sorrow can become an opportunity for transformation. Um, for what then matters is to bear witness to the uniquely human potential at its best, which is to transform a personal tragedy into a triumph, to turn one's predicament into a human achievement. That's Longfellow's late career, dealing with actually the ennobling qualities of suffering. The ennobling qualities of suffering. The late career rewards attention. You don't need to go through the depths of it. It's all there in the poems. It's all there. And to me, he's a consummate artist, and he's a consummate person. Not perfect. And he's someone that we can learn a lot. This is just little notes to myself. I found this, these are fragments. I'll just show this to you. A young critic is like a boy with a gun. He fires at every little thing he sees. He thinks only of his own skill, not of the pain he's giving. So I think, maybe that's me. <laughs> you know, maybe I shouldn't be grieving and suffering. That's also from 1879. And here's the last one. Many critics are like woodpeckers who instead of enjoying the fruit in the shadow of a tree, hop incessantly around the trunk, pecking holes in the bark to discover some little worm or other. <laughs> Maybe that's me. Thank you. Thanks for being here. <laughs>